Witam Cię serdecznie w kolejnym odcinku podcastu Dzieci Zdolne. Dzisiaj jestem bardzo podekscytowana, ponieważ łączę się z gościem ze Szkocji. Moim gościem jest profesor Margaret Sutherland, która w Uniwersytecie w Glasgow zajmuje się w ogóle całą dziedziną, którą, jak, którą nazywamy e, The Gifted Education. Jest również dyrektorką organizacji, która się nazywa The Scottish Network for Able Pupils. Wspiera szkoły, a także rodziców w rozpoznawaniu i także opiekowaniu się potrzebami zdolnych dzieci. Margaret opowiedziała mi o tym, jak wyglądała w ogóle ewolucja podejścia Szkocji do edukacji zdolnych, ale także podzieliła się kilkoma bardzo cennymi radami dla rodziców na temat tego, jak rozmawiać z nauczycielami i szkołami swoich dzieci. Jeżeli to, co robię, jest dla Ciebie jakoś wartościowe, proszę zalajkuj to wideo i zasubskrybuj kanał Dzieci Zdolne. Today my guest is Professor Margaret Sutherland. She is an international expert in all things gifted education. And apart from having over 40 years of teaching experience in mainstream primary schools as well as uh, higher education. She is also the director of the Scottish Network for Able Pupils. Uh, this is, I understand, an organization that is aimed at spreading awareness uh, of the needs of the gifted population and an organization that advocates for inclusive education for all. Margaret is also a senior lecturer and the director of postgraduate research at the School of Education at the University of Glasgow and a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. You are also an author of books on gifted and talented children, like Gifted and Talented in the Early Years, that's a practical guide, and Developing the Gifted and Talented Young Learner. So for everybody here, you're going to see the links in the description of this video. Thank you so much for joining me today. Not at all. It's a pleasure and lovely to meet you and to have this opportunity to share and talk and discuss um, about children who are gifted. Thank you. Margaret, you have been working in the field of inclusive education basically all around the world, helping both staff and students in, as I read, in Europe, Asia, Africa, in the United States. So I guess that you have seen very different approaches to the field of gifted education in various countries. And when I look at Poland, at what's available here for the gifted pupils, gifted students, I basically see two paths for the gifted kids. It's either acceleration of the educational path and skipping grades, skipping classes, or individual education programs that are outside of the regular class. So my first question to you is, what does the recent research in uh, the field of gifted education say about these possible ways of supporting high ability kids? Do, do they work? Do they not work? What is your take on that? Well, I think one of the things I would say is, and, and this stems from having, um, as you have said, worked in this area for all this length of time, um, and also having come out of the stable of inclusion, into this world, if you like, of, of gifted education. And I think um, there's a few things that, that strike me. One is there is no one way, I don't think, to do this. So it's I don't think there's a blueprint out there that we're all searching for that we then put into place and go, tick, done that for our gifted children. Um, I, I think as the minute we come to think about supporting our gifted learners, we have to also consider the culture and the, the place that our young people are, regardless of which country that is. And more and more, I think we also have to look at the history of the education system that we are working in. So in my own case, um, I've, I've spent time sort of reflecting and looking back the way. Um, the past explains the present, but doesn't need to define the future. Um, but I think it's important sometimes to see where we have come as a country um, to where we are now in order to know where we want to go. Um, so I think there are a few things that re regardless of, of whether we're going to skip grades or, or what we're going to do, we, we need to look at that um, more holistically, I guess. Um, and for me, if we are talking about inclusion, inclusion has to include gifted learners. If it doesn't include gifted learners, then it's not inclusion because we're of excluding course. a group. Um, and so, again, I think we need to look and see where different countries are with the, uh, their understanding of inclusion, with look and see what is possible and practical within our education systems too. And I, I certainly um, am not an advocate of policy borrowing where we mm -hmm. look across the world and say, oh, look what they're doing. We'll do that too. And therefore we will have the same effect. 
So I suppose that's a very roundabout long way to actually coming to, to, to the, the issue that you raised in your question about what the research says. And of course, it depends where you look what the research says. Um, one thing I think we are we, we do know from the research is that our gifted children, regardless of where they are and what country they're in, do need an appropriate curriculum and they need appropriate challenge. And I think what we end up debating often is then where does that happen? And, and that's partly what's behind your question, I guess, what you're saying is right. about individual plan, is it about like, grade skipping? And, and the answer is yes, it, it's, it might be both of those. Um, I think there's a lot of things we need to, to take into account, not least of which is the young person themselves and what is appropriate for them and what will be best for them. Because while grade skipping is good for many children, it's not necessarily good for all children. And we need to look at how we do grade skipping. I think there's a lot of questions and things that need to be in place before we do it, while we're doing it, and after the child has skipped the grade. So um, I, th I think that there is no one blueprint. There's no one easy, short answer to that, other than we need to take into account the culture we need to take account of the educational history of the country and we need to make sure that young high label or gifted young people are getting the right appropriate uh, right and appropriate challenge in curriculum yeah that makes a lot of sense uh, you know when when i again try to put this what you are saying into the context of poland i feel like we our approach towards education and inclusivity has changed over, let's say, the last two, three decades, so since, since the 90s, uh, with a heavy focus on helping the, um, the ones who struggle with education. So uh, obviously children with some developmental deficits, uh, children who come from backgrounds where they don't have this, you know, cultural support to, to, to become fast learners. But also sometimes it's like a, you know, zero-sum game. So if we help children who are somehow disadvantaged so to speak uh we cannot help the ones who are gifted uh, absolutely and i am um, i recognize all that you have just said there i think there's a, a few things I, I would pick up on i think um i think you're right that often teachers want to help the children who are struggling in that belief that well you're clever you'll be fine away you go you you can already read it oh, yeah. I want to help the children who can't read um and in and, and one sense, that is, is kind of understandable, perhaps. However, I think that kind of approach very much comes out of perhaps a more needs-based model of education, where we look at what do the children need, and then we end up getting into prioritising needs. And therefore, always, I think, when we're coming from a needs-based outlook, it is the children who are struggling who will end up coming to the, the top, if you like, to get the support. And so one of the things we've been trying to do in Scotland, now I'm not claiming that Scotland has worked this out and that it's perfect. It's it's not. But I think there are some things we've done that are helpful and useful. Um, and one of the things we've been trying to do is to move from this idea of a needs based model of education to a rights based model. Oh, because if it's about rights, then it's about everybody's rights. And gifted children have rights just the same as a child who is unable to um, read or, or has a disability or, or whatever. And I think we also sometimes come at these two things as see them as very opposite ends, if you like, of a spectrum. And yet sometimes I wonder just how different what we need to do for these children actually is. Um, and you've asked what happens in Scotland. Well, interestingly, since 2004, Scotland hasn't talked anymore about the idea of special educational needs. We, we changed our legislation in 2004 and we said, um, and partly by the way, we changed it because it wasn't working. What mm -hmm. we did before for children with special educational needs, which excluded, as we would call them, high label or the gifted, it, it wasn't working for them. And we said we need to do something else. And so we reconceptualized how we think about learning, about barriers to learning and about those who experience barriers to learning. And we talk instead within the new ledger, or it's not so new now, but within the then new legislation, we talked about children who might require additional support for learning. 
And it wasn't just a change of names, because if we're serious about who might need additional support, well, it actually began to include lots of these groups from kind of around the edges. So children for whom English is an additional language, for example, didn't right. sit comfortably under special educational needs, but they needed support. Children who are bereaved, where a mother, a father, a brother, sister, somebody dies close to them, well, they're in a state of, of um, trauma and, and they need additional support and they didn't fit under the old SEN banner. Children, if, if you're right-handed and you break your wrist because you fall and you can't write for the six weeks you have a plaster on, well, you're going to need additional support. So that idea of short-term additional support and crucially, for myself, my, myself and my colleague at the time were dancing around our office when the act came out because it said also children who are highly able or gifted and talented, who are working ahead of where you might expect their age peers to be working, also might need additional support for learning. And so our legislation, I think, helpfully frames the idea of who needs additional support in a way that allows us, if we want to, to stop thinking about special education and who needs support and to saying who have barriers and how do we remove those barriers? And that, as I say, includes high label. Now, we have the good legislation, but that's only one step because legislation is only any good if it's then translated into practice. And right. there are schools doing really good things, and there are schools who are still thinking needs not rights and not everybody. So as I say, I'm not claiming Scotland has fixed this. Of course, <laughs> I, but do you? Uh -huh. because I do think the legislation we have is, is good legislation. No, I think good legislation is something that, you know, you, you need to start with, because after all, uh, I read somewhere that, you know, as in Poland, also in Scotland, the public education system is um, the majority, right? So like in Poland, I think 95% of pupils use yeah. public public school, and I think in Scotland and it's the a same similar in, number, right? Same in Scotland, yes. So it very much depends, you know, the legislation somehow determines what the schools can or cannot do. Uh, for the pupils and where they get what they get money for right yeah. because after all it's always about financing so I wanted to ask you more specifically what is this additional support is it you know like extra teachers or you know individual classes what is it technically speaking um technically it, it can be all of these things um but it is it, the idea of this additional support is about looking and saying what are the barriers and what do we need and how do we remove those barriers and it, are these um, the schools who decided what the it, barriers are and how to remove them or is it, it some I'm like, like state manual on you know removing barriers one on one so, <laughs> yes yeah, so we have um well, well schools are the people that first and foremost see the children um and and know their children working and of course and talking I would argue they need to talk very and work very closely with parents so they get a holistic picture of the child but it's um but schools are are very much um at the forefront of this it might be about employing staff they're, they're, they may have additional staff it might be about looking at how the curriculum we in Scotland we don't have a national curriculum uh, we have a national guidance national framework um but it's not a national curriculum which there is a slight kind of difference there but we do have a cur curricular framework and it's about how schools then use that um, and interpret the use of that. And of course, that's another issue with the guidance and the, the legislation too. Um, I still speak to schools who I have to remind them. And you know, we're nearly 20 years removed from the start of this legislation. And I still have to say, yeah, but that's that's the legislation the needs of these children comes under. Oh, oh yes, you know, almost as though they've forgotten. Um, so um, a, a lot is about the interpretation of it. We have 32 education authorities in Scotland, and they too have a role to play in this in terms of um, providing support for learning um, and, and thinking about additional support. It sometimes is things in the classroom. It's sometimes things in the school. It's sometimes people in the school. It can be out with the school. So that there's a, a, a real a range of things, I guess, that, that can come under this heading of 
additional support. That's very interesting. So it, it, it somehow seems like there is, a, you know, the more creative a school or the more creative the teachers employed by by, by a school, uh, the better the options for the pupils, right? Well, I think in a school where the head teacher, who I think is a crucial person when we're talking about supporting learners and learning in schools, I think when a head teacher gives teachers permission to try things, to maybe be a bit creative, to have a go at something and be prepared that if it doesn't work out, that's okay. What have you learned from doing that? And how will you do it differently the next time? I think when you're in a school where teachers feel they have autonomy and the curriculum allows them to have some flexibility and autonomy and our curriculum in Scotland does, then I think if we can get those two things meeting together in the right way, then, you know, there are wonderful opportunities that schools can provide. I'm not saying it's easy. And I think since COVID, it's certainly even even tougher for schools. I think schools have, have had, you know, have had a hard time. I think we now oh, have yeah. in our schools who some of whom are, are struggling to know if they're young, knowing how to share because they haven't had to. Um, I was doing some work with, with children in secondary schools. So in Scotland, secondary school is 12 till sort of 17. And we had senior secondary school um, pupils from a number of schools. And it was interesting talking to the staff. They were talking about, and, and these staff didn't know each other. Um, but when they all got talking, they were saying they've noticed a real anxiety amongst the pupils since coming right. back from COVID. And in fact, they've found sometimes this year, the 2022 school academic year starting and for us starting in August, they've found it even harder some more challenging behaviour and a sense of entitlement. And, mm -hmm. and they, they, so I think schools are, as we all are, I guess, within society, learning to, to deal with all of this. So, um, yeah, there's some big challenges ahead for schools. That's true, not only in the field of the gifted education and uh, how yeah. they able pupils. Uh, yeah. Margaret, so uh, another point where I can see... Um, a challenge for for every educational system, but for Polish specifically, is the question of responsibility for identification of the highly able people. So, some people say that well, it should be parents who, you know, realize that the children are somehow maybe gifted or or have these special um, that require some some additional support in learning. And some people say that, well, it should be the responsibility of the schools because, well, how should parents know? Parents are not trained to recognize, you know, giftedness. What is your take on that? Like, what works better? What works in Scotland? Um, if I answer the first part of your question, what's my take on that? My take on that is the responsibility of everybody. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was thinking about that question, actually. And, you know, I think it's the responsibility of parents, of relatives, of health visitors. I don't know if you have them in Poland, but they visit children in, when they're very young, when they're just been born and mm -hmm. right uh, till they're you know sort of heading towards school um i think there's a um something for them to be looking out for they will pick up on children who are perhaps not developing in the way one might expect um but i, I often wonder other than saying oh that's great can they do that already what do they actually do about children who start you know talking at 10 months walking at 11 months right um, reading yeah. when they're age two um i i'm not i think there's a kind of subtext of you know if your child's not doing this by age two be afraid be very afraid but oh yeah um, i don't think we have the opposite which says we don't you know, well if they're <laughs> doing that at six months be afraid be very afraid we don't um, have it <laughs> yeah so i i think there's a job to be done there still certainly in my country um with with health visitors with gps etc um i think you know so and teachers absolutely early years educators nursery kindergarten staff i i think it's everybody's job it i think that um african proverb you know it takes a village mm -hmm. to raise a child right it's absolutely true we we all need to be looking and be prepared to be surprised and um because i think the other thing to remember is that that children behave differently in different contexts oh yeah mm -hmm. and so you know snuggled up with your mum uh, with a book 
and she says, you know, what colour is this? And you say red, you know, and you're sitting beside a cosy fire. It's a very different kind of environment from in a kindergarten and, and somebody's, you know, doing some kind of test on you and you say, what's that colour? And they just sit and, you know, they won't answer you. And, Absolutely. Um, because you know, like, and then they go, they go or, yeah. yeah, and then they go, so they don't know their colours. And the mother's like, well, I know them in my house. And you're, you're like, oh, dear. So I, I think, you know, a lot of that for me is about everybody playing their part um it's also about trust I think we all have to trust each other as well because I think you know in that little scenario there um the teacher or the, the early years kindergarten worker is is telling the parent what they're seeing they're not lying um mm -hmm. but equally the parent's not lying either so there's something about bringing all of that information together and working together and sharing to better understand a a, a child um now there was a second part to your question i forgot what it was yeah how, how does this work in scotland like is there any oh, like, yeah, responsibility I, on schools when it comes to identifying how high, highly able yeah people? i mean I, is there a particular responsibility well yes insofar as um the additional support for learning act talks about schools and authorities identifying young people who might need additional support and then providing it so in that sense that that legislation is there um, but I guess in practice, it's, it is about schools um, looking at what they see in front of them, often parents talking to them as well. I, I spend a lot of time talking to a lot of parents about how to go and talk to the schools. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, some of that is just about sharing information um, about what the child can do at home on their own, unaided. But, you know, here, here's a list of the books they've read. The book uh -huh. you're sending home is not kind of matching up with what they're doing here. So, again, you know, we're trying to encourage that sharing of information. I guess if I think um, I originally was a primary teacher, I, that's where I started my career was in, in primary education. And I suppose for me as an educator, um, I, I actually, rather than start with identification, I would want to start with provision. Uh -huh. I would want to start with looking at provision in order to identify. Interesting. So mm -hmm. one of the things myself and my colleague Neve Stack talk about is, you know, well, OK, what does it mean in your school to be highly able at mathematics, reading, whatever it is? And, you know, what, what would you expect a child to be doing that would make you go, wow? Mm -hmm. um, and then the next thing, having looked at and thought about that is to say, well, when in your classroom do you offer an appropriate activity that would allow you to see them doing that? And and often that's when teachers go, ooh. Yeah, because very often well, this often, education and teaching is aimed at, you know, tests or some kind of yeah, evaluation. Or, or the middle. Or, yeah, yeah you're, they're not looking for more. They're not expecting children yeah. to do more than the kind of the, the very minimum. So um, so my argument would be then that, that you need to offer that opportunity to young people and see them who identifies. Now, you will have as a teacher at the back of your mind that it'll be, you know, that one there and that one there. And it probably will be, but it could be another two over here that you just didn't notice because you hadn't offered the right opportunity to them. My worry about starting with identification is that we get some kind of checklist that says, mm -hmm. a gifted child will, do, 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 do. and you walk in mm -hmm. and you say, right, where is the child doing? Do, 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 do. And if you don't see them, you say, well, I haven't got any. Um, mm -hmm. Or you only find the two here you don't find the other two over there. And so I I, I would really, you know, I'd spend a lot of time trying to encourage schools to think about provision because provision is really important in all of this, I think. Yeah, that's that's very interesting observation that you that you made because you know in this tradition of gifted programs that require passing some tests, it really uh, makes it harder for children who are not, you know, specifically trained for testing to show their talents and some of them are talented or highly able in areas that are not say discoverable by tests like I know like empathy or, or leadership skills yeah. or you know some artistic expression so there yeah. are many you know areas where you can be gifted so it is interesting what you're saying that with this approach uh, you, you give them the chance to 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 get recognized yeah I, I think I think as well for identification it's not just one thing I think you know I think it is about provision and I would I would stand by my argument about mm -hmm. you know provision being part of what you use it's not the only thing you use but it's part of what you use um 
tests have their place, but I think we need to remember what that place is and what they tell us, and crucially, what they don't maybe tell us. Um, I'm very interested in young or children, young people who come from areas of deprivation, mm -hmm. where they have not had all the input from home that many other children have. And yet when you as the school start to, to put in place some of the experiences that these other children have, have already had, wow, look what these young people can do. So I, I'm interested in, in, in how we think about all of this. We might have to think harder and look differently in different places to see where these children are that, that have that spark um, in order that we can help them to flourish. Yeah, that's interesting. I also wanted to touch on another thing that you said, uh, mentioned earlier. So this uh, trust-based relationships between teachers, parents. Uh, what I can see, for instance, among the, the parents that, that belong to the community uh, that I run, some of them say that when they talk to teachers or talk to you know specialists, psychologists and so on about the children, trying to basically find a path or a good educational like, you know, good way of supporting their children. You know what mothers are like. They want the best for their kids, right? They often face a wall of mistrust. And this expression of like, oh, every mother thinks every that thinks mother their is special, <laughs> right? Like, every mother has a gifted yes. child, you know. Yeah. Your kid is normal, you know. Well, prove that he is or she is really special and requires something special show me you know the the, the, the test diplomas or, or whatever trophies that he or she uh won so um i don't know that it's cultural specifically for poland or i can see you shaking your head but it's not but no it's not just poland <laughs> how, to, how can parents who because it is a very sensitive topic you know if it you is. try to to somehow advocate for the needs of your kid because you think that your kid is a little bit different might need something different and somebody says to you that well you are mistaken because your kid is absolutely normal yeah how can you i don't know push or, or advocate for the actual needs of your, of your child and fight with this misunderstanding? Yeah, I mean, I, yes, I think it is a tricky one. And I don't think it's it's something just um, just that happens just in Poland at all. Uh, it certainly happens in Scotland. Um, but I think it's quite interesting because if you remember when I talked about the Additional Support for Learning Act and the whole sort of previous thinking around SEN and so on, there's often an assumption that... Um, if, if you're going to talk to the school about your child because they're autistic or dyslexic or dyspraxic or any any of those other labels, that you'll get a better hearing, a fairer hearing. Mm -hmm. um, and experience would tell me that's not the case. Um, and also we have a report that came out um, that investigated sort of 20 years after, or all coming up for 20 years after the, the act came into being, there was a, a report commissioned and that's one of the things that the report found. In fact, all the issues that came out of, they, they spoke to the person doing the report, spoke to many parents. They came and spoke to myself and, and my colleague Neve about um, gifted education as well. And, and, and the commonalities across the piece between parents who were trying to advocate for their child, regardless of why they were trying to advocate, that there were common issues. And... And the whole kind of trust and 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 sharing and and so I think um um you you talked about mothers and, and presumably fathers too of course the, the too. best the best <laughs> for their children and the problem is that schools often want the best too the problem is they're coming at it in different ways oh, yeah. different ideas of what is the best um and I suppose. For me, it comes down to relationships, 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 relationship between the parent and the school, the relationship between the school and the parent. And, and I think both sides have to work hard at those. It's not something that's all just down to the parent. It's not something that's all just down for the, to the school. Um, I, I talk a lot, as I say, with parents and, and often they're going to speak to schools um, and and they want to know exactly that question. How how can I get the school to listen to me? Right. And and I mean, certainly in Scotland, I, I don't know if this would apply in Poland, but in Scotland, you know, I will say things like, you know, don't use the word bored. Teachers okay. are very anxious. You know, bored? Have you seen my classroom? How can they be bored in my classroom? You know, Um. 
the teaching's a very personal thing and I think yeah. the teachers perceive rightly or wrongly perceive they're being criticized or being threatened then mm -hmm. we come out with a certain behavior and sometimes it's a oh really how dare you kind of behavior and that's mm -hmm. that's not helpful for taking anything forward for anybody so you know I would talk about children liking challenge I would talk about them seeking challenge, um, which by implication is they're bored, but but you're not using but the language, any, the phrasing yeah. is different. You're not but using that emotive word bored. It's um, a golden advice, Margaret. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's like, you know, for me, it's gonna make a lot of difference. Um, I mean, other things, certainly in Scotland, I mean, you'll you'll have heard me use the term highly able, and we don't mm -hmm. use the term gifted and talented in Scotland. It has a lot of baggage attached to it culturally and, and socially and so on and so it's not the perfect term either all names and labels of problems but we do talk about high label so one of the things I say to to um, parents is you know don't don't use the gifted word <laughs> because that also and again this may be true for some teachers in Poland that can put a barrier up oh gifted and exactly what you said every parent thinks their child's gifted oh yeah and um, also it touches on this elitism you know this thing yeah. that they're better Elite, yeah. and worse yeah. and this again you know touches on the whole history and the context yeah. of what it was like in the 19th century and you know then you are doomed basically absolutely and I, I think when you're talking when a parent's talking to to, to teachers and certainly all the parents I've spoken to they they all know that teaching is tough and they all know that they have this huge range of, of children in front of them. And I've had parents of children, high label children say to me, but Margaret, they've got children in the class that can't read. And, you know, I'm going in saying, well, he needs a harder book. And, and that's where I come back to this idea of rights over needs. Um, and that's where the act's also helpful too, because it's about education. And, and the other thing is, again, in my experience of working with teachers, Teachers, most teachers went into teaching because they wanted to help children to learn. And I think when you can bring it back to this idea of learning, you know, I really honestly, hand in heart, can't think of a teacher in Scotland that if a parent goes in talking about, listen, you know, I, I've noticed my child's kind of switching off learning. They're, they're really not interested. They're not coming home excited. That I honestly don't know. I can't think a teacher in Scotland come out going, well, I don't care. <laughs> no, I, I just right. really honestly don't think teachers in Scotland would do that. Um, and then you've got a point of 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 connection where you're saying, well, you know, you don't want them to 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 not want to learn. That's what school's about. That's what teaching's about. It's about learning. And I'm saying to you, well, I've got this child who's kind of getting switched off learning here. Then that's a point of of moving forward and saying, well, what what do we need to do? How can I support you as a parent? And then the teacher also, I am you know very much beholden on them saying, well, you know what can what can you teach me about your child? And that's where I would come down to this idea of parents knowing um, their child in in you know different contexts and different settings in a way that a teacher just can't, you know, mm -hmm. so sharing yeah, of information coming together acknowledging you both want the same goal you just are need to find the way for you both to kind of get there that's very interesting so your advice is basically to to not to build these like defensive um, relationships where you protect your child and there's this you know hostile teacher who is here to <laughs> smash the child or, I think, or... yeah I mean I, I know having worked with a lot of I've worked with a lot of parents I've also worked with a lot of teachers and and I know myself, even when I think back, you know, from when I time I was in school, I got nervous at parents' night. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, gosh, yes. Teachers, uh -huh. you know, because you're like, oh, I've got, you know, 30, 33, perhaps. Right. Come again, all with, you know, their child. As um, the most important, right? You know, most important child. Now I've got all 30 of them to look after you. Um, and you've got parents coming in with different experiences of school. Some hated school and bring mm -hmm. all that hate with them. Um, You know, they, they come in with different expectations. They... You know, and so I, it, it, parents' night is a it it, it can be quite um anxiety inducing, <laughs> but I think again, you know, as a as a teacher, I also know that parents are coming into my classroom anxious as well. Of course, and, and the yeah. problem is if you get two anxious people that 
bang together. <laughs> That's not going to get us anywhere. Whereas I think, you know, the professional, the other thing is pa- parents are emotionally involved in this in a way that teachers aren't. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the emotional involvement a parent has in their, in their child is very different from concern and care that I would have as a teacher. Um, and so I, I do think when it comes to something like Parents' Night, for all I'm the teacher and I'm anxious, I need to get on top of that and I need to respect and 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 work with the parent in a way that makes them feel relaxed, that makes them think, yeah, actually, she's somebody I can talk to or he mm-hmm. is somebody I can talk to. You, know, the, the teacher is somebody I can I can come and share my concerns with. And so I think if we both come into the room, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh-uh. we're going to get nowhere there we we need to sit around the table and work together mm-hmm. yeah that's that's very true very true uh margaret uh when you also mentioned the autonomy of schools in scotland and this uh kind of responsibility of everybody to to identify to notice to observe the children and, and their higher abilities uh i was also wondering you know it takes uh, some perspective and experience in order to be able to take care of a highly able pupil because you know if you have a child who knows much more than you who is much more intelligent than you you know like we all, we've all seen such children right uh, it's really hard to build a relationship with such a child to build your authority in front of such a child because these kids know better right they very often tend to be um, very self-confident so how um, does it require any does Scotland do any training for teachers or so that they know how to how to work and you know how to live with such children um do we do any training there's nothing systematic I wouldn't say um I suppose one of the things I would say some of this I think starts in initial teacher education so with in terms of working with teachers in our, our universities we have nine or ten I can't remember universities who engage in initial teacher education and um, we have something called the Scottish Universities Inclusion Group and each of the universities um, who work in initial teacher education have representatives on that group I am myself and a colleague Ina Shalveth are, are on the group uh, representing the University of Glasgow where I work um, and and we talk you know a lot there about um starting right from the beginning of of how we work with parents because um very much i think a lot is dependent on the reaction that that a child gets so you know often children can be labeled as being cheeky um mm-hmm. because and and all they've done is actually correct you when you were wrong but you know they've maybe not known how to do it in a way that didn't make the teacher feel that size but I would come back to that idea same with working with the parent you know the teacher in all of this is is the professional I think um you know I, I often in fact I, I do lectures for our undergraduates and I'll say to them listen these children just will know more than you about things not everything but some things and you know get over it they just will. Don't try and win a battle with them. Don't try and win an argument with them. They just know more than you do. Accept it and move on. And I think there's ways of of dealing with a child, um, you know, that doesn't diminish the child and doesn't make them feel worthless. Um, that talks about saying, well, I don't know, is is that right? Gosh, okay, let's see what we can find out together. And I think there is. I think we need to com- disimbue teachers of the thought that they know everything and have answers for everything they just don't and that's whether a child is gifted or not you know teachers are not perfect they don't they don't have answers for everything so I think there's a lot to be done there um with the teachers with initial teachers and student teachers um and as as they enter the profession specifically for gifted yes but actually much wider than for gifted I I you know I, I think again it's about back to that idea of how we we treat people how we relate to people and I also think there's something about the idea of layers of support so I think there's a lot a class teacher can do for children who are gifted and I think we need to make sure as a class teacher we are doing all we can but there does come a point where it's not just down to the class teacher and it becomes perhaps a school-wide thing how does our school 
support these young people um, and there may be different you know people that could be involved at school level then in, in Scotland's um, scenario it would then be about well okay what about out with my school so if I'm a primary school can I get support from the local secondary school where there perhaps are expert or, or more knowledgeable teachers in specific subject areas yeah. and then out with that at you know university business master classes all kinds of things um nobody knows everything mm -hmm. and how does this work technically like because for instance uh, recently i had an interview with a uh, with a mathematics uh, teacher who um was mentoring a seven-year-old boy whose algebra and, and maths in general are at the level of uh, second uh, high school second grade so very very advanced and uh, you know for, for such children at some point high school will not be enough like you know he's going to be 10 and he's going to be well beyond high school curriculum so obviously he needs some curriculum enrichment but high school teachers even high school teachers are not well equipped to enrich a child with and uh, enrich his cur curriculum what? because I, they I, are not that you know well yeah. well versed in mathematics after all uh, they teach high school not university algebra uh, so how does it, you you mentioned this collaboration between you know graduates uh, universities colleges uh, middle schools primary schools and and so on maybe business as well uh, how can this be obtained you know um, in a systematic well, I think, way I mean again I don't think it, well I don't think it's systematic but I think I do know that um, that that within my own university there there's um, a colleague in our school of mathematics and statistics who is doing a lot of work around schools and curriculum and so on um, not necessarily just for gifted but is involved in looking um, at some of the developments within the mathematics curriculum for example um, I think there's a lot of materials that you can use um, that are online I think things like MOOCs have opened up possibilities uh, online learning I, I'm not sure that in schools we're terribly good at, at using even in spite of COVID and Zoom and, and you and I sitting tonight talking, yeah. I'm still not sure we, we, we're utilizing all of that kind of um, opportunity as much as we could. I think very often, you know, the kids themselves, that they know more about all these platforms and online oh, yeah. tools that they, they, they could use. I've seen, you know, children, you know, seven, eight years old who are very, uh, uh, very knowledgeable about where to get their online courses, you know, and where to learn something. But I'm wondering, you know, does it make sense for such children to just graduate earlier and, you know, go to college or go to Well, university? yeah, I mean, I, I was thinking about that question um, earlier when I was looking at the questions that the kinds yeah. of questions we're going to be asking. And, you know, what does what does going to university do for you earlier? Allows you in, to enter the job market earlier? Is that necessarily mm -hmm. a good thing? I, I don't know. Um, it gets down to the question of what's the purpose of education, right? At the well, end of the day. Yeah, yeah. And and I think the other thing is for me, I think for gifted children, gifted children, I've mentioned acceleration, gifted children do need to move up. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they also need breadth and they need depth in order to come back in and, and move on again. Um, mm -hmm. I worry when all schools do is breadth. I, I, I think they need breadth, but not only breadth, they need depth but they do need to come in to come back up. Um, and so I guess, you know, pushing children constantly through a scheme or a system or a um, a curriculum is, is not necessarily always the answer either. I think looking for those ways that, you know, if we're talking maths and, you know, using applied mathematics or using maths in different contexts, real world problems, um, you know, finding problems, never mind so you know, finding solutions, but actually, you know, finding the problems, letting children come up with those themselves. You know, I I think there are many ways that we can we can come at that, um, that 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 help that that offer the challenge that children need, but isn't always about up 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 up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's kind of like the the easiest or the simplest solution to come up with. So like, let him or her make you know. Yeah eight grades uh, in three years and this is going to be challenging right because you need to move fast and I think too with something like mathematics you know quite often parents will talk to me and when they talk about what their child's good at their child's very good at computation yeah 
Um, mm. So that's one bit of mathematics. Of course, so it's and then about, you know, abstract. Yeah, yeah, it's about looking across the whole you know, gamut of what constitutes mathematics, you know, shape, position, movement, information handling, problem yeah. solving, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and the use of mathematics as well, not just being able to do complex sums, but, you know, using it. And, and there are big mathematical problems that, um, you know, people haven't solved. And oh, are, yeah, you know, they're Absolutely. work away. And, and I think it's really good for gifted kids to realize that, that, you know, you don't, always have that eureka moment it takes a long time sometimes to get to that eureka moment and building in the shoulders of giants and all that kind of thing so mm -hmm. yeah that's true that's interesting um Margaret, one last question uh, that i also wanted to touch on um uh, coming back to these other solutions that the polish education system offers to their uh gifted children gifted pupils which is individual program individual classes which is basically uh you know taking the child out of the regular class or group and offering them either um, a completely different curriculum in a specific subject or in all the subjects. So uh, obviously there are some pros because it is, it is challenging. If you have a really good, you know, cool teacher, it uh, may be, might, might be really life-changing for a kid. But uh, do you see any drawbacks of such an approach? I mean, I think, I think, I think high label learners need an intellectual peer. So I think they need opportunities to work with like minded peers. Um, how and where we do that is is the bigger question. Um, and I think there's a place for taking children out to do things. Um, that whole revolving door idea, they come out to do something to come back in again. Uh -huh. um, they don't always have to go out. They may stay in. Um, I think um, I think there's something about about the child also or the young person knowing that what they know is valued by everybody, and so you know if if they're looking at something something in particular, I can't think of a topic off the top of my head, but if they're looking, you know, um, volcanoes, you know, we have a very basic question, where do you find volcanoes? Um, uh -huh. Chris Smith in our book about uh, gifted and talented in the primary school talks about this, you know, where do you find volcanoes? And, and you know, a lot of the class go off and they look at maps and they say, oh, you get them in Japan and you get them in Italy and you get them, you know, whatever you get volcanoes, Iceland. Um, and sometimes your gifted kid goes off and, and they come back talking about tectonic plates and they uh -huh. well, actually when you match up the gifted information, the child, the, blah, 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 the information that the gifted child brings back, actually those tectonic plates are under Iceland, they're under. Yeah. <laughs> so so it's about letting them see that, yeah, you've, you've gone off and you've looked at this in, in this very different way, perhaps, but it's equally as relevant mm -hmm. um, and, and together, you know, it makes us all more knowledgeable. It makes us all richer, et cetera. So I, I think that there's things you can do in the classroom um, with age peers, but I also think there is a place for them having that intellectual peer. You know, if they grade skip completely and they join them all the time, then that's one way. The other way you're talking about, I mean, did you mention um, individualized education plans, IEPs? Did you yeah, know? yeah, that's yeah. That, that's very similar to that. But yeah. so we we have those here. We also have. I'm seeing an increasing use. I think in Scotland, we have a of something called a GIRF me plan. So we have a bit of legislation called GIRFEC, which is getting uh -huh. it right for every child. Okay. Again, my argument is, if we're not thinking about gifted within this document, then we're not getting it right for every child. We're only of getting course. it right for some. So it, it does actually lend itself beautifully to, as you'd expect, to, to gifted children. And one of the things that being schools are starting to develop is something called a GIRF me. So getting it right for me plan. Uh -huh. um, and Originally, that was around children who were struggling, just as we mentioned about the often being the case in Poland. But I'm increasingly talking to schools um, who are thinking about how to use a GIRF me plan for a high label learner. So I, I think having that plan and, and ensuring that that in that planning stage, you're thinking about your gifted learners and that they're not a kind of add on at the end. Oh, we better think about something difficult for them to do. It's got to be kind of integral to to. Um, your work as you're planning so I, I think they can be helpful too as can coming out and, and meeting a group you know a couple of other learners um been talking to schools where they've been getting children who are um 
showing a propensity towards something or an interest in something, getting them out, you know, Wednesday afternoon, they're working on a kind of topic project and they'll do a presentation to the whole school about that. Uh, once they, and that's mixed ages. I think one of the huge big problems we have in schools and, and not just in schools, but in our mindset is age and stage. Oh yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, as if it was equal for everybody. Yeah, whereas it's not. Yeah, yeah and I, I, I was quoted once as saying, "If you're 13 and you cannot read, you're a problem to society, teachers, peers, and parents, because you're 13 and everybody that's 13 yeah. should be able to read." Now, the flip side of that coin is, if you're three and you can read. <laughs> Well, guess what? You're a problem to society teachers Absolutely. and parents too, because you should not. You should be over there playing in the sand and the water, exactly. yeah. reading War and Peace. So there's something I think around not just schools and teachers, but but around society more generally, where we just don't deal with difference terribly well, whatever that difference is. So you let's know, hope, that, yeah. Whether the difference is ability, um, or how you look, your skin color. We, we just yeah. don't deal well with, with difference. Even 20 years ago, people who would use the left hand to write, yeah. they would be discriminated or pushed Tied into using, <laughs> using the right. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, these days it's not the problem anymore. You just write with your left hand and it's fine. So hopefully yeah, we're going to also was, change our yeah. approach. Yeah. I was talking to a group of teachers and, and they were getting quite depressed about things and, and challenges and, and so on. And, and I sort of said, well, that's, you know, and that, that's why I think you're know, looking back and I mentioned about a country understanding, looking at the past to understand where they are at the present, because, you know, we have come on a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And I think things like the Salamanca statements in the 1990s, 1994, that, that really pushed forward that thinking on inclusion. But the broadening out of how we now understand that, because it's it's gone, it's moved beyond disability. It's not just about disability now. Um, you know, I think all of those things are, are actually huge things that have happened in a relatively short space of time. Oh, absolutely. You know, yeah. They may not have happened fast enough for us, and there's a lot more to do. <laughs> But but gosh, you know, you every now and again it, it can be good to look back and say, oh yeah, actually, you know, we we have progressed, we have moved on, and and I think one of the big things for us now, and and you know where we are in the world, and and all the things that are going on in the world, and migration, and climate challenges, and wars, and all the rest of it, you know, we we need to ensure that we keep moving on, and that we don't move back. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is very, very wise ending of our conversation, <laughs> Margaret. So thank you so much for for uh, for speaking with me today. Not at all. It's been an absolute pleasure. Lovely to talk with you. Dziękuję Ci za wysłuchanie dzisiejszego odcinka. Jeżeli to, co robię, jest dla Ciebie jakoś wartościowe, proszę zalajkuj to wideo i zasubskrybuj kanał Dzieci Zdolne. Jeżeli interesuje Cię tematyka zdolnych, zapraszam Cię na www.dziecizdolne.pl, gdzie znajdziesz całą społeczność rodziców zdolnych dzieci.